everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Robert J. Arnold. Robert is a Washington State-based martial artist best known for his gal-style bagua. He is the author of an autobiography, Chasing Dreams to China, successor. And he also runs an online tutorial program, Warfox Bagua, and a YouTube channel under his name, Robert J. Arnold. Hi, Robert. How are you doing this morning? doing really good man excellent introduction i love that and i'm glad you got my book that's, that's cool. yeah i'm enjoying the book and I, you know it's like uh i bought it on amazon and you know the price was a pretty pretty low price and i did not expect the book to be as big as it is <laughs> it's a it's a good read it's a yeah there's a lot a little to bit say of everything in there coming of age story plenty of action plenty of uh, a lot of laughs in it too it's a good book <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you very much i appreciate that not not at all so the, i guess the book is actually a good place to start because it is your life story and mm -hmm. um you know in the beginning of the book um you made the comment that you grew up in a uh, how did you term it a, a, a semi-militant household i think is how you described your father's parenting style so could you My talk dad. a little bit about those early days and how your dad got you into martial arts you and your brothers uh, my dad, so like, yeah, he was in the military for just long enough to get the mentality. And, um, you know, it's interesting because he was Golden Gloves uh, boxing champion in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. And uh, he got into an altercation with somebody who did martial arts. And this is way back before all the MMA and stuff. And the guy, I think he did like Taekwondo and, and like, you know, really, you know, stuck it to him. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. He didn't say he lost because my dad would never say something like that. Uh, but what what happened was he was convinced enough that he got us all into martial arts. And then so we started at four years old. We were doing like we had this militant kind of Taekwondo regime and it wasn't for any competitions. It wasn't for, uh, you know, any kind of performances. It was like, you know, to protect yourself because of. Uh, that at that time, we still had the, the the KKK would do their marches every, I don't know, not every month, but at least at least once a year, you have these little marches where they were, you know, expressing and, and we went to school with their kids. Yeah. And that was basically something that we like, you know, their kids, I, they had all kinds of things they were dealing with, too. As I grew up, I learned later that, you know, that people are all basically kind of a product of what's introduced to them. Right. And so I so I don't even hold any grudges against them now. But what they did help me do was uh, figure out how to use stuff more effectively, because it's kind of like tomorrow we're going to school and these guys are going to try this. And so we had to try to use what we had uh, to develop. So that was our household until I was about 13. And when I was 13, we moved to Washington State. And in Washington State, I found out that like, wow. America, like, you know, is, it's not all like that. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of friends and um, we, we had a lot of fun. And then at the time, martial arts became more like a, a journey to something that I wanted to explore deeper into, you know. Um, I mean, I can keep going because this is like, you know, it's. Yeah, please like, do. It's, <laughs> it's in the book. Right, yeah, you know. So from there, um, I started training. Uh, I started teaching martial arts here. I got into a bunch of different styles. Uh, I started teaching here at WSU, Washington State University, when I was about 16. And, um, you know, I got to a point where I realized, like, wow, I got all this good information. And now how am I going to pass this on? I'm going to learn more. Um, and so I had to, I, I got to a point, I, I met a roommate. I realized I had to learn Chinese yeah. to kind of get to the root of the stuff that I was learning. Cause even in Korea, you know, like a lot of the kicking styles that they had in, uh, in what I was doing with Filipino styles, there was kind of a general source. I felt ch learning Chinese would help me get deeper into that. Learn Chinese. And uh, I went to Taiwan and I, when I was about 22, 23, and then, um, you know, I I found Bagua, which is nice. the style that I represent now. And I, I've been, you know, I, I learned Bagua there for about 20 years. And now I'm back home. So that's my story in a nutshell. It's like, I learned that, I mean, there's this term that we use a lot called external and internal. And uh, external is like necessary to understand why 
you need internal. Um, you can't really appreciate the value of what internal means without having some form of uh, external understanding. You know, like you, you, there's there's a better way to block. There's a better way to kick. There's a better way to punch. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't know how to kick, block, and punch. And so my initial upbringing that my father gave me kind of introduced me into this uh, need for a way to do it without being as as violent, right, as I had had to be in before. So that's kind of long and short of it. And now I'm trying to introduce that. And, you know, I have uh, I went to the NSA and uh, a few different places to kind of make, you know, my, uh, my acknowledge, like acknowledge that I'm here now, I'm back now. And, you know, and uh, I really want to like help people understand that we have all these beautiful options of how to move and uh, for health, uh, for protection. And, uh, but like a health, because what's probably gonna kill you is not some guy in the alley. Right. It's gonna be, it's gonna be your bad habits. It's gonna right. be the things that you haven't really uh, taken over in your life. And, you know, those things can, we can call it hereditary, but like we get these things passed down to us and now it's laid upon us. And it's like, how are you gonna get out of this situation? It's the same. I, I don't. I don't see any difference between getting out of a wrist lock and getting out of a, a, an addiction. Uh, they're they're very connected because basically there's a path that there that will lead you into your freedom, and that's what training every day is about. You know, and and in China and going and talking to monks and all that other stuff. It comes down to that. Like you are going to be the biggest uh, obstacle in your life. Yeah. So. Well said. I totally agree. Uh, this is one of my teachers, um, early teachers put it to me that it's like um, playing poker. You know, you get dealt a hand in life, you know, being your genetics or whatnot, your genetic predispositions, but you still can use the hand that you're dealt to, you know, to win, yeah. so to speak. And, and that's that's where your martial arts comes into play, you know, controlling the things that are under your control. Absolutely. Um, so when, when going back a little bit when you were younger, you know, you did have to fight some, you know, for self-defense. Um, what, what kind of things did that teach you, uh, as far as, um, how did it change your outlook on life? Because I, I remember at one point early on in the, in your book, you talk about how you, you had the sudden realization that most people didn't know how to fight. You, you got into a fight and you were like, wow, you know, you, you realize that you're sort of light years ahead of people just because you knew some, you know, you had some basic skills at that point. How did that change the way that you interacted with other people? How did it change your outlook? Well, okay. I mean, there's there's multiple aspects of this. Uh, I, I would say one in 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 regards of how I chose to uh, what the next style would become for me. Um, when I got, I had an altercation. My brother had an altercation. Oldest brother. Somebody grabbed his leg, and uh, when he was throwing the kick, because we we're doing taekwondo, threw him down to the ground, and then got on top of him. And uh, after that altercation, he really got into uh, grappling. Like now he feels like, you know, like it's necessary for him to know how to grapple and everything else like that. Um, and and uh, he got his brown belt in jujitsu. He's about to get his black belt. Uh, like that affects him, you know, like for the rest of his life. My brother yeah. Aaron, same situation. Somebody grabbed his leg and then he, he countered and threw like, you know, some punches and and, and knocked him down. And then after that, he got into Wing Chun. And so Wing Chun became kind of his answer for his equation of how things happened to him. For me, uh, I threw a kick, somebody grabbed my leg and, uh, you know, I threw a bunch of fakes and tricks. And so for me, it became more of like kind of deception, um, which is what Bagua is really about. It's like, I want you to go this way and that way. So that changed how we would go into our journey of what martial arts meant you know like for him it was the the grappling and then the, the striking and for me it's just like you know trickery that's why i'm the fox you know the war fox like i'm, I'm going to trick you into thinking that you are into this and we're into that but i think that more importantly if we could all get to a page where we're understanding ourselves like, I think that understanding ourself is so, it's so difficult because we have these distractions of like, you have 
the news and you have these moods and the moods are so um they're they're they encompassate you they make you feel like i am this mood i'm very angry about trump i'm very angry about immigration whatever it is that feeling and that sensation is going to become uh it's going to be active in what everything that you're going to do is and so if you can kind of just use your art which is like for like every day i train i tr i just finished training it's it's not because it's cool it's not because it's fun it's not because it's uh, i'm not making any money from it but i'm i'm a train again tomorrow and the, what i get out of it is the filter the filter of like okay what is really me when i'm all by myself and nobody's around and nobody cares and there's no benefits except for what i'm doing in myself and that lets me see clearly like kind of like what i need to do next in my life so i i always use this is a basically as a, a spectrum of where i'm going to go to next and and what this is really all about I hope that answered the question. I don't know if I was roundabout. No, it, it did answer the question, and it, it it's kind of ties into what you were talking about with deception. You know, um, deception is a a tactic or a strategy in fighting, but you also in learning that sort of things. You, you I think you can kind of learn how you deceive yourself, and and training is a way to to break out of that because you you can't can, you can't fool yourself. You know, when you're training, yeah. especially in something like martial arts. You know, it's it's working or it's not working. There's there's no self deception. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, you, you mentioned that you train in a lot of styles and, you know, speaking deception, you know, you train in, in ninjutsu a little bit and, and Jeet Kune Do, I think. Um, what was it that you thought was missing in your art that caused you to learn Chinese and decide to go to Taiwan? Oh, that's a really good question. Jeez. Uh, like, um, I, I realized that I, I was learning. So, I was learning so many movements from uh, the, I even brought Bruce Lee's book, you know, the Jeet Kune Do thing, the, the Jeet Kune Do way. Um, I, like I had my black belt and I was getting my black belt in another style. And I just felt like the, there was always this information that was written down on our tests. We had these like tests where we had to write, there was stuff that was written down. It was like, it was either in Korean, it was in Japanese, it was in all these other languages and I was kind of like, I could even ask questions like, well, what does this really mean? I don't know this word here. I don't understand this. Can you explain it to me? And they didn't really know either. And then I realized it's kind of like, okay, well, I have to get past the middleman because the middleman is like, you know, and everybody should, by the way, I mean, even if you're learning from me, if you're learning from me online, if you're learning from me in my books or whatever, like you should really get past the middleman because if you can make a direct connection to the original language, uh, it will make things a lot more clear for you. And then what I found is after I learned Chinese and I went to China that most Chinese people didn't even know what martial arts was. So that shocked me again was the fact that I, wow, like you guys don't know what it is either, you know, and um, it, it comes to a point where it doesn't matter where you're from or what languages you're speaking, uh, martial artists are the only people that understand martial arts. It's not a cultural thing. It's not like you automatically inherit uh, an understanding of some kind of viewpoint or style because you grew up in a particular country. And, you know, I spent my whole life then after that's That's kind of a reason why I became the headmaster of Bagua from my lineage only, by the way, you know, because uh, my master's, uh, son was not interested in passing the art on because he wanted to make money which is completely reasonable you know because you're definitely not going to make money teaching martial arts and passing on traditions that's not <laughs> that's not where the money is you know unless you figure out some way to make it into some kind of massage therapy that everybody wants right martial arts is kind of a dying trade so i felt that i had gotten so much from it I just wanted to keep it birthing and growing into other individuals. And that's what I'm basically doing here now. So when you got to Taiwan, how, how did you, how did you find your master? How did you find your teacher? Um, did you train with other people to begin with? And there, okay. I want to do this the best I can without 
naming any names. Okay. Right? Because, Understood. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, but when I first got there, um, I didn't really know what to look for or what I was looking for, but I was, uh, I knew that I was looking for Bagua and I didn't know where it was. So I kept asking questions. I lived in the hostel for like six months. I was asking other people about it. They all pointed me into re- the direction of a guy. Um, I worked with him. He was, uh, he was a very you know nice guy, friendly, and uh, the most popular guy, even still probably in Taiwan. And, uh, but I felt myself, because when I got to Taiwan, I had already been practicing martial arts for 20 years. And I felt like, well, there was something still lacking. Like there wasn't a, you know, when you know somebody knows how to fight, like, you know that, right, you know? And you know when somebody knows uh, uh, details and information. I mean, in what I've, my experience, there's so many different types of masters. Uh, some of them are really good at uh, collecting swords. Some of them are really good at, you know, meeting up with other people and holding events. And some of them are good at, you know, uh, just practicing the style, maintaining the style, passing on the style. It goes on and on and on. But they're all masters in their respect because we kind of need everybody to do a part in order for everything to be maintained. And um, I wasn't feeling like, like, you know, for me, because my background has been like, I was always self-defense, like I had to protect myself. And if you couldn't speak that language to me, you know, I, I didn't really understand, you know, not to say it was anything wrong. I just like, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not planning on doing it for this or that alone. I need to know how to teach my kids now who are in the art, uh, how to protect themselves from, from danger. And uh, I, I, I ended up finding, this is embarrassing almost, but I'm going to tell you because I'm going to be honest because this is this is our broadcast. I saw a girl uh, on the train and, uh, you know, she had muscles, like real muscles. And I'm thinking yeah. like, wow, this girl has muscles. Because in Taiwan, it's been a long time. I haven't seen any muscles on a woman, like, you know, never. So I, uh, you know, like talked to her a little bit. And uh, I see that she's teaching boxing. I'm like, that's cool. We start doing some combat back and forth, you know, kind of trading a little bit. And she threw something. And I hit her with a Bagua move that I had learned from China when I was an exchange student. And she was like, you know Bagua? And I was like, just a little bit. And she was like, you need to be my master. And then after that, she uh, introduced me to Wu Guozheng, who's my master. And, um, you know, like he really broke it down in, in a lot of ways and aspects that I could understand in health and combat and everything else. So I trained with him for the, you know, the next 10 years. Uh, but really, um, that introduction through that girl, and you know, it was sad because she stopped training. She got married, right? And she got, she got married and she stopped training because her husband said that her muscles were too big. And I was like, I, ha- I can say nothing. <laughs> I can say nothing. I'm just going to move on with that, you know, whatever. But uh, but it was my introduction and it was a good introduction. And uh, yeah. So. so for people that are watching and listening, could you describe how your lineage of Bagua differs from, uh, say, like Chung style or Yin style? Is there something that a, a lay person could pick up on by watching it? OK, so, well, one in Gao style, we always like what, what makes it different than the rest of the styles is the, the whole idea of the concept of pre-heaven and post-heaven, right? Um, and that was kind of introduced by Gao Yisheng. Uh, and he really, you know, he had thousands of students. Um, so it went from my lineage, so let me just, it went from Dong, Dong Hai Chuan, Chen Tinghua. And then Chen was the, the, the next guy after Dong after Dong had been teaching it in the Imperial Palace for a while, I think it was Palace of Su. And then, uh, but he had the four students, Yin, Chen, and two other guys. One of the guys was really, um, he had, he was really well off financially, so he didn't need to pass the style on. And the other guy, um, please don't quote me on this, or, but we're recording, so I guess you are quoting me on this. He had a temper. And he uh, he wasn't very good at passing it on either. There's all kind of rumors and myths that he got killed by somebody sent from the Shaolin to stop his evil practices, blah, 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 whatever. There's a billion of those Kung Fu stories. But so in 
Yin and Chen were the guys. Then they passed it on to Gao. Now, Gao learned from Chen. He uh, said that he met a guy named Song Yire. This is written down. This is what they say happened. Song Yirin had figured out the 64 palms uh, a different way than just the circle, right? Now, uh, whether you believe it's true or not, this mythical character had given um, Gao the way to practice within a straight line. And so the straight line breaks down for us into uh, eight different sections. So you have heaven, water, mountain, thunder, wind, fire, earth, and lake. And every one of those uh, sections is a philosophy of how it moves. And you can see that in my book. So especially in my, my book, uh, Master Trades for All Outlaws, that's how I'm introducing it. Um, but basically, heaven is like direct, straightforward, uh, striking, um, hitting, um, honest connection. Water is related to kind of manipulation of the hands, flow of motion, arm locks, joint locks, uh, stopping things as they come in. Mountain is counter counterattacks, like you are in your position, you will not change, right? Uh, thunder, vibration you know, through the body, through how you resonate your body, how you can hit and shake through somebody, right? Uh, wind is the way of the elbows. And I know we think of elbows as kind of like a colliding force, but elbows in Bagua are used more of circling and swirling to get somebody in a better position. Uh, fire, kicking, leg, well, kicking, tripping, legs, uh, pulling and pushing uh, to burn somebody up from the bottom up. Uh, you know, and then earth is the opposite of heaven, which is uh, deception, which might or might not be my best style, uh, but leading somebody one way and pulling them to another thing and then lake, which is depth where you are. So like, you know, we call it footwork. Basically, when you're in the same spot, how you can like if you're fighting in a phone booth, how can you use footwork to get around this guy and basically drown him in your space? So those are all philosophies of the 64 palms uh, that we refer to as post heaven, like after heaven and pre heaven is the circle. Pre heaven is what you need to create the power, because if you don't do the circle, all the other stuff is just like empty, you know, pinatas. It means nothing. It's, it's, it's nothing. So you walk the circle all the time and then you basically do that uh, straightforward practice so that you can kind of get uh, effective reaction. So that's kind of, you know, that's how it's presented, um, right? Everybody has different things. I know people, other people will say they have post seven, pre seven too. I, I don't know. I just, I read the books, <laughs> right? I read all of the, there's a lot of Chinese information that's never been translated. And uh, I do my best to translate that for people if there's an audience, but I need the audience first because it's work. So if there, if there is an audience, I will translate a lot of that stuff into English if, if anybody's interested or curious. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. So how was this presented to you as a new student? Did you work with each one of these concepts individually? Was there a progression? Uh, did it depend on the occasion? Well, I think that, so the beauty of Bagua, any style of Bagua, I think it's like, a, it's so infinite that you can start anywhere. Yeah. You know, like you can you can start inside of weapons. You can start, you know, with the spear mm -hmm. or the staff. You can start inside of the footwork. Um, but the way it was introduced to me, my master had me work with what we call like the uh, 25 invasive steps. And I'm glad I started there because there's basically 25 different movements that you can use stepping uh, high and low and spinning and turning that will help you understand later on uh, how to do different movements that are incorporated in both the circle or in a straight line, because basically Bagua always comes down to footwork. So we, and we have a phrase we use a lot, whereas the legs carry the body and the body carries the hand. So every time I hit you uh, or, or I block, the first thing that happens is my legs move. And uh, so my leg moves so I can put you into a better position for this block or for this strike. And you have the full, um, you know, in government, you have my whole weight against you when I do that. Uh, but um, I think that, so we have 33 different styles, 34 more or less, but they're all basically like, if you, if you look at a tree in that 
root of the tree is the circle. And then it branches off that we have a particular style here. So, you know, like I'm teaching my son the seven stars, which is basically kind of like the head and the shoulders, the, the elbows, the knees, the kicks and the palms. Right. You know, the seven stars. My other one's learning the uh, like uh, the three principles. Um, there's OK, I, I need to say this so it makes sense. So you have in the beginning, there was nothing, which is what they call Wu Ji or Wu Ji Tre, right? I think a lot, a lot of people probably have heard of that before. A uh, Wuji trend is kind of like where there's nothing or just emptiness, then you can create something else. And that goes into the two uh, powers, which is yin and yang, right? Um, yin, and, yin and yang, I, I don't know how you guys say it in America. <laughs> right, yin and yang, which becomes basically like Tai Chi. Then the three principles, which I'm teaching my son, which is heaven, earth, and uh, man. Right. And those three principles, like it breaks down in combat, it's like high, medium and low. So it becomes like a game of paper, rock, scissors where you're doing you've mastered high and low in this kind of combination where somebody can't stop it. After that, four directions, which is kind of basically the number of creation. So, uh, you know, north, east, south, west, uh, then five elements, five elements, which is Xing Yi, right, uh, that we know about this in the six harmonies and then the seven stars. And then the eight trigrams, which is Bagua. And there's more after that, which is the nine palaces, which is a Bagua footwork that we know. Um, but basically, they're all enhancements that would make your style more effective. So when I teach a student and I see that maybe he's a little clumsy here, it's like, okay, you need to spend more time in working on the evasive set steps in addition to your Bagua practice. So you have your Bagua practice, which is regular, which is tailored to person to person because nobody's going to learn the whole thing but i can kind of do some things that are going to enhance the things that you're good at and then kind of nullify the things that you're bad at so you can get to a point where you find balance right and so that's why they have all those styles that's why you know you know my master and me we train for so long not just to kind of help you more uh, uh be healthier but also to find a balance that will make you healthier you know, when you're when you're dealing with things with your wife and your kid and your dog and your car, right? Like, you know, you're like, we are our own biggest ab obstacle. So, yeah. Can be for sure. Yeah. So how long had you been training with him before um, he asked you to start teaching on your own? Or did he ask you? You know, I think that one, my master was really cool because I had I was already teaching before I came there. Right. And then um, and he understood that. But I didn't feel comfortable teaching martial arts. I, I didn't feel teaching Bagua uh, for a while. So I, after I trained with him for about three years, um, naturally, people started asking me questions and I started kind of teaching him and I asked him if it was OK. And uh, he was like, yeah, man, you know, like, it's your art. I think he made it very clear. Like, it's like, it's my art, but it's your art, too. And what you want to do with your art is your business, you know? Yeah. And then so he, he made that really clear. And um, I, I, I really respect that because there's most of the people that you, know, you meet, most of the teachers you meet, uh, especially, uh, you know, Chinese tradition, they do not carry that same philosophy at all. So that was very unique that um, like, you know, I won't say that he he didn't just allow me, like he encouraged me. And uh, a lot of times when people would ask things, cause I had other movements too, that I was kind of putting into the style. Uh, cause it makes sense that, you know, I have Filipino styles with sticks and stuff like that. And he was like, you know, I was like other people like, is that really part of Bagua? And he's like, the way he does it, it is. Because if you use the root, then whatever the extension is on the branches and the leaves, it's connected, you know, but just have the root and then basically it becomes you, whatever you want it to be. Right. Uh, but on the same account, uh, your snozberries need to taste like snozberries. So I'm not like, uh, I mean, that's Willy Wonka right. quote there. You know, I, I'm not like, I'm not into the thing of like, you do Bagua to go practice, you know, and then somebody fights you, you start using kickboxing. Uh, I am not into that philosophy at all. I mean, like, I, I understand that if you want, if you feel more comfortable using kickboxing when you've been practicing Bagua the whole time, then you should really go just study kickboxing. Like, s save yourself the time, 
you know, <laughs> the, the, like the, the movements are complicated and complex. So, but I believe in, I don't believe in mixed styles. I don't believe in mixed martial arts, but I do believe in enhancements. So you can practice any style in like, you know, just like, uh, what's his name? Ronzi, Rody, Rody, Ronzi, 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 Ronzi. That girl who did a bunch of judo. Oh, Ronda and Rousey. She, yeah, Ronda Rousey. Yeah, yeah. And then she, and then she went to the MMA or in the UFC, you know, and then she added some punches and some knees and some kicks, and then her judo was really working, yeah. you know, um, and all, all the people who really stick out have stuck with one style, and then they add little bitty enhancements to make their style more complete, which is like basically evolving, you know, but um, yeah, that's my, that's my take on it. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's, I think Bruce Lee had a quote, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something along the lines of most people have, you know, two hands and two feet and there's, you know, only so many things you can do. So all styles contain, you know, similar yeah. concepts, similar techniques. And they're all beautiful. Like, to be honest, man, I yeah. love, I mean, man, I, I've seen, I've like, you can't do it all. It's a thing. You cannot, you know, you can't do it all because to really get down to a point, but I've seen every single style has impressed me. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, every single style has shown me something that's like, whoa. And, you know, and I honor that and I, I respect that and I admire that. But I just because you see something that's beautiful doesn't mean that's related to you. Uh, like, you know, like uh, find your art. Don't be confused by all the beauty out there. You know, you can't tree. Right. Just find find your art. Do your thing and admire and respect everything else. That's just how I do it. Yeah, that's good advice. So when you were training in Taiwan, were you coming back and forth to the United States at all? Or were you there pretty much the whole time? Um, oh, I came back a few times. I mean, I guess it, all in all, I think maybe I came back like four times, you know, and uh, and I had some students here, you know, which was really um, like after I had been training in Taiwan for like five years, I came back here once and uh, some people found me online and then uh, they asked to meet up with me and I, I trained them for like six months you know, when I left and uh, they kept practicing it now and they're very, you know, important uh, individuals to the style because they still know it. So I meet up with them, I show them more stuff and I just basically keep adding and enhancing to it. So uh, it, like if it's in you, you know, to get it, you're going to get it. There's nothing that can stop you from getting it. If it's in you, you know, like that's just, it's a natural occurrence. So, uh, but yeah, I only came home maybe like four times. I came home because you got I was, I was a, uh, when I was in Taiwan, I was kind of a little bit of a superstar, teeny yeah. tiny, teeny tiny superstar, right? Let's just say it like that. And so I was on stage and doing shows and on TV shows and, and it was great. And then I came back here the first time, really coming back here. And I was working at a, a like one of those survey companies and I was just calling people from, you know, and then this grandma, you know, cursed me out. She was like, you don't have a thing to do with your life. And I was like, damn, I, I do have better things to do with my life. And then, so I went back to Taiwan. <laughs> like, you know, like, seeing, like, you spoke me in the right direction. I was yeah. doing better things, you know? So, but like, I think it comes down to now that I have kids and stuff, though, I don't want my uh, kids to have the Taiwanese Amer the education. Uh, the Taiwanese education is like, I mean, it's very smart. It's not nothing like that. It's more that it's so, forceful that it, it kills a lot of the creativity yeah and uh, you, you know I, i've been teaching you know english and chinese for 20 years and i i see kids just really lose their spirit um because of the way that it's just forced on them and i'm like look i don't want my kids to grow up in this and that became my incentive to come back to america for good or at least until they're 18 right right there they're eight and nine right now so uh i'll be here until they're you know 18 19 2021 and then i'll move back to taiwan and retire basically yeah so i know that you have an online school do you have a physical school as well do you, do you do training in person i i do i always so i always have physical students um like right now i got some guys that are that are training really well i was teaching at wsu again um for the last year and then i had to kind of sneak in by using yoga so by the way like i said like yeah i teach yoga and you know, Tai Chi and self-defense and slowly no, snuck around the Bagua. Wow. You know, you gotta, you gotta do it so people understand it. So I snuck into the room, you know, with yoga, but then I found some real good students there. So they're about to come back from their break. Uh, hopefully we can continue on that. 
Uh, but basically what I found, the same as my master's, uh, privates is the way to go. So because, like, I don't think everybody is uh, thinks the same way. I don't think everybody needs to know Bagua. I don't think everybody needs to know martial arts. You know, like, I mean, depending on how you live, maybe your martial art is your money. And you can, if you're good with that, then use that and use your stocks and get out of your situations. Uh, but for me, like, so, like, just doing it privates right now is going really good. I online um, has proven to be way more effective than I thought. So let's pretend that there's a million people in the world that want to do my style of Bagua, right? And how could I really realistically go and meet with all these people in South America and different places in Europe and uh, in Australia? I'd love to, and I will one day, you know, like with all my online students. But first, like to get this foundation uh introducing things and i say something online and then they give me a video back so i can make corrections and then i give them something else and they give me that back it's an interaction and uh honestly it's it's just as good an interaction as you get with a lot of masters that are you know that maybe have a big reputation because when i was in taiwan training with a lot of masters they wouldn't even talk to you to directly they would send their students to you to show you how to do this and how to do that so you never work with them anyway Right. You know, so I, but I think that online is like a, it's not something that any martial artist, all of us, we feel is going to be like, oh, the most effective way to learn. But on the same account, it's like, isn't it better than not learning? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. And then by getting that kind of initiation of like how movements can work, that can inspire you to actually go find somebody in your area that can help complete you, or I can come meet with you. You know what I mean? Like back and forth. So, Online is 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 the way of the future, like it or not. Yeah. And uh, if we, you know what I mean? If we don't try to figure out a way to let people understand who want to be next to us, you know, we're going to go the way of the dinosaur. So, yeah. Well, that ties pretty nicely into my next question. Is, uh, one of the things I usually ask people towards the end of the interview is what they think the future of these arts are. And I, I kind of wanted to tie this into two. You meant you talked about your boys some. Um, you, um, you know, I, I know like in your situation as you were growing up, you know, martial arts, not exactly a choice for you. It was like part of your, your, your household. And it's the same thing for me. And it's the same thing for my son as well. I, I told him when he was very little, like three years old, I was like, this is just what we do. You know, while you live here, this is what you do. Yeah. So what do you think the future of these traditional arts is? And how do you think that ties into how we get our kids involved? Okay. Yeah. It is two questions because yeah. one, I think the uh, the the future of martial arts itself is what it has been in the past, and our generations will change and fluctuate about um, the emphasis of it. But like for right now, what it is is kind of like a practice of movement. So like being able to continually find balance in your physical movement as it's manifested into a physical movement. That helps me at work. You know, I'm working in electronics now and I can put stuff here and pick stuff up here and do this here or I need to pick up something heavy. I know how to do that. Uh, the, the application or the function of what I practice right now and is what people kind of need to see what martial arts is for is to be more effective at everything that I do, period. Even fishing and uh, playing pool. I think the only future, you see what I'm saying? Because you're not going to, if you're, you're not going to get into a fist fight, probably. But if you are getting into a fist fight often and you're not a soldier, right, you're immature. Yeah. <laughs> There's something going on in the head that you're not learned. You haven't even learned the next level of the martial art. But being able to, like I see now, that, like, you know, I'm 44. I see a lot of people at my age right now that are having problems with, like, you know, basic movements around the room. Uh, picking up their kids you know their their wrist is sprained easily like so like for health purposes and being able to function as a dad you know um martial arts will always have a future and and that's the physical side the mental side is the like doing something over and over again when it's raining when you break up with your girlfriend when uh you know you have a car accident uh, just continuing to practice actually instills a sense of value in yourself. 
that you start to realize that whatever your situation, whatever your job, whatever your status, uh, single or married or whatever, you start to see that I have this value and regardless of how the world changes, I will stay the same on this line. And, um, and that gives and breeds, which is always done confidence and, and direction. Now, as far as kids go, um, you're basically sharing that with them. Like with my kids, like, how do I get them into it? Just like you said, um, how do your kids, you know, learn English or math? Like they didn't have the choice. Right. It wasn't like they chose to say like, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to learn all this stuff. No, you get to school. It's illegal for them to not be in school. If right. they're not in some form of school, what I found out as after I was a dad, you know, people will call you and say, hey, why are your kid not in school? And I'm like, uh, is that any of your business? It's like, yeah, actually it is my business. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. I don't want to get into that. So, right. but the reality is, it's like, so if you have to do school, then you have to do martial arts too. You know, like, uh, and until a point, until you get to a point where I feel like you can physically protect yourself easily and you understand the concepts that I've introduced. And that's probably around like the same way my dad did with me when I was 13, it was a choice. He's like, okay, now you can choose what you want to do. But I was already that good at it. I was like, well, I want to keep doing it. Wow. You know, so, <laughs> you know, like same thing I'll do with my kids. It's like, once you have, it's like a, a lot of it in, in Asia, this is not strange because a lot of parents introduce their kids to playing the piano and they're yeah. playing the piano since they're five years old and, you know, and they get older and then like they get a point where they can choose, but it's like, but you're already good at playing the piano. Why would you stop now? Right. And I think that as regardless of whatever you, you do martial arts or whatever, I think you need to give your kid an advantage, right? Because like, otherwise it's going to be like, like, like a little bit, like almost like MMA, you get a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and get a little bit of that. And then by the time you're 16, you don't really have anything that you're very good at. Yeah. You know, you've experienced a lot of stuff, which is good. But if you can give them something over the years that they have to kind of keep uh, going into, and this goes into the late section, right? Finding depth in something that will let you find depth in everything else right like what does it really mean why are you practicing what does it come down to and it's really just between you and the universe you and the universe are having a conversation and you can use martial arts or mechanics or anything you want to use but by understanding that it goes that deep it will put you on a path that will let everything else have better answers instead of some kind of like you know what i mean like superficial over the top like you know you're a republican i mean you're you're, you're a democrat see things a little bit deeper right see what the, the what the human figure is really about and then you'll be able to come up with a lot better answers so that's what martial arts as i see is, is the future is is people coming into an understanding of what it can help you with in your day-to-day -day battles because it's about combat your day-to-day -day battles you know and uh especially with confidence or like addiction or uh like you know anger issues whatever you're dealing with that can help you overcome those. And that can help us all evolve as a society. So uh, like the way that yoga has been introduced as a way to kind of like, you know, take away tension and stress. And now everybody's doing yoga, sure. And eventually everybody needs to be doing martial arts, um, not just for self-defense, but to see that you can progress in your own life. Well said. Robert, it's been great talking to you. We're just about out of time. Would you like to tell people where they can find out more about you and your teaching? Well, you already mentioned my uh, so my online program at warfoxbagua.com. You can get on there. I'm going to be adding, I'm going to add every single movement uh, in my style, which is 2,500 movements. It'll be over the years. And I need, if you go there, feedback. I want you to show me what you're doing so that we can make sure we're all making progress because you're representing me. I'm representing you. We're all having a good time. Uh, my YouTube videos, I'm not on YouTube as much, but I still put stuff up. Facebook is easiest to find me if you want to ask me a question. Robert J. Arnold, J-A-Y. Add me on and, you know, we can talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, it doesn't have to be martial arts, uh, but I'm married, so don't get freaked. <laughs> all right. Robert, it was great talking to you.